All right, everybody, Powell wants pain. He wants pain. He wants to put pain on all of us. Hey, everybody, it is Friday. Big down day in the market Friday, August 26th. Jay Powell spoke at the beautiful Jackson Hole Symposium today. It was a big buildup yesterday. We had a big rally, a short covering rally. But man, did he squash that rally today. And he sent out checks to the shorts. The shorts got checks today for sure. But let me go over the whole thing. Powell wants pain. That was his message. It was a very severe message. He said we're going to have to have to go through pain to bring down inflation. If I was there, I would have asked him, uh, Jay Powell, Mr. Chairman, what kind of pain is the uh, are the recipients of 25 billion extra in interest income receiving and what kind of pain will they continue to feel as rates are hiked and that is a fiscal expansion and the government pays more and more interest but you know the story you know where I am on that this today folks this was a classic monetarist meltdown the, and the monetarists actually they're they're cheering this because as you know they've been very very bearish and negative on the market and that has manifested in a record short position at least on the part of funds and small speculators um, I'm very anxious to see the uh, CFTC's commitments when they come out a little bit later but this is classic. This is classic. I mean, when you have um, an environment where investors and the entire professional investment analytic economic class, profession, whatever you want to call it, when they adhere to one belief system, which is monetarism, uh, and, you know, the god of monetarism is the Federal Reserve, all right? That's the god of all gods. It's even above any other central bank god. This is the ultimate god, the Federal Reserve. Uh, when the Fed speaks, the monetarists will react. Now, we know, or you should know by now, that those reactions are based on a deep, a deeply flawed misunderstanding of just about everything that that you know revolves around monetarism It's a flawed understanding of interest rates it's a flawed understanding of uh, monetary policy in general it's a flawed understanding of, of uh, monetary operations like quantitative easing and quantitative tightening but whatever um, so this was completely expected, although I will be honest. I will be honest that, that I thought this morning, and I did send out an email, I, I thought there was a chance that Powell could come out with a little bit more of a dovish message. And I, and I think the market was kind of also leaning along those lines because the reaction today on the downside was very, very severe. Uh, as to reflect, I think, extreme disappointment. But I'm going to get into that and why I'm going to get into why you shouldn't be disappointed. And actually, I did some buying today, uh, maybe a little bit premature. But, you know, I, I, when I see things down, I mean, they're like, for me, it's on sale. I, I want to go in and I want to buy um, so this this was a class. Oh, the reason why I said that I thought maybe we'd get more of a dovish statement was because when I looked at Fed fund futures this morning, okay, um, the F uh, Fed fund futures were pricing in a 75 basis point rate hike in September. We know that that's been you know that's been there for a while and it's been kind of wavering back and forth between 7550, 7550. But then the last couple of days. You know, it was pretty solid on 75. And then, um, actually yesterday, it went, it went to, uh, uh, well, we got a 50 basis point expectation for November, okay? And then we had a 25 basis point uh, prediction based on where those futures are trading for December. And then uh, a 25 basis point hike in January. So... 
two things. Number one, there wasn't a lot of change. And by the way, the 50 base, by the way, even today, let me point this out, that even today with, with uh, Powell's really, uh, pain, pain, even with his hawkish, you know, that's Jay Powell, you know, now he's talking tough, man. Uh, even with that speech, not no change in Fed fund futures. So like the market went crazy, but bond market, you know, kind of crickets and Fed fund futures still pricing in the same thing. And by the way, that that 50 basis point rate hike in November, uh, and even the 75 basis point rate hike in September, that's only like a 60% probability. It's not like a 98% probability, all right? So that hardly moved after he made this, you know, really tough uh, uh, speech. And the 50 basis point hike in November, that, that's kind of like even Steven with a 25. I mean, I think one is like 46% probability and the other, and a 25 is a 45% is a probability. So they're almost equal. So, you know, I don't know, bond market didn't really, it wasn't really phased too much the way the stock market was. And then he's talking about the, uh, the Fed going to a 95 billion monthly uh, decline in its balance sheet. Look, as far as I'm concerned, I'll believe it when I see it. I mean, they were supposed to be doing, four, was it 47 and a half, 47 and a half, 47 and a half for like June, July, August. That never even happened. I mean, it's down only like 60, 66 billion since the end of May. I mean, that's, you know, 47 and a half, 47 and a half, 47 and a half is like 130, uh, 130 something, 135 billion should be down. I mean, we're not, we're not, we're halfway there. So like, as far as the 95, but, but let me say this. I want the QT to happen. Like I've been saying, like I can't wait for the QT to happen because we need the QT. All right? We need to train. Look, reserves are at 3.3 trillion. They hardly uh, those are reserves at Federal Reserve banks. We got 2.5 trillion in the uh, the repo, the reverse repo. So we're still up around 5.6 trillion in system reserves. There's been no reduction in that at all. That, as a matter of fact, in this latest week, once again, the banks had to shift deposits over into the reverse repo. It was up. So, like, I want that QT to happen because even though loan growth has been really, really good, it's going to get a lot better once that QT starts, and also that QT, I, I, I'm, I'm making this prediction, and I made this prediction since the beginning of the year, folks, and you know this. You know, these, these monetarists who are just like out of their minds bearish because of QT, they're going to learn a very painful lesson. Now, they'll never admit it because when the QT starts, and you know we start we start to see a, a, a really pronounced acceleration in bank lending and that's going to flow into the economy and economic expansion is going to be even greater um stock market's going to go up i mean we're going to have uh profits corporate profits are just going to be booming okay the funny thing about pal i'll reiterate something that i said a, a long time ago he was in he was right and I said it recently again, like he was right and so was Yellen when they said that inflation was transitory. It was all, it was all due to supply disruptions from the pandemic. I mean, we see it now. We see prices coming down, you know, in many, many commodities and in finished goods. Um, but like he, he always falls victim to the pundits and, and, you know, the pundits and then the market reflects you know, how many times do I talk about headline trading? Like people read the headlines and then they react to that and then they position themselves based on that. So what is the outlook? I, look, you know, I said back in July, I spelled this all out for you. We're going to have a big, you know, we're going to rally up. We're going to take out the mid-June highs. We're going to go up and then we're going to hit a wall 
based on the September 15th quarterly corporate tax payment, that'll be like 110, 120 billion. Uh, and um, uh, but I think, and I could be wrong on this, but I, I have a sense that some of this selling, not all of it, but some of this selling is now kind of front running the corporate uh, tax payment. In other words, what do I mean by that? I mean like companies may now be getting liquid a little bit in a little bit of, uh, in, in advance of that September 15th due date on uh, corporate taxes. And today might have been one of these days. And I don't know, I'm just speculating here. I could be completely wrong. But I'm speculating that they might say, you know what, we're going to have to make this tax payment on September 15th. The market's going down. Let's just raise, let's raise some cash right now for companies that have to. Not every company obviously has to do that. A lot of companies, they have the cash on hand or, or you know, they might, they might uh, uh, tap credit line to pay, whatever. Or, uh, you know, but, but I'm thinking that maybe some of that selling today is front running for that uh, corporate tax payment, just raising some cash to make that payment. If that's the case, if I'm right about that, then the, the payment on um, mid-September, it, it might not be that uh, destabilizing as, you know, as I was anticipating. And again, it's not going to be as bad as you know the boom boom the one two punch we got in april and then june remember i talked about that yesterday april tax collections boom 324 billion a very modest uh may rebound of 89 billion uh, net uh, inflow net flows and then boom another 100 something billion on the corporate tax payment in in june and it took us you know the month of july and now august actually uh Here's another thing. The deficit is now up to 1.12 trillion. That's the high for the fiscal year. I mean, we're just, the pool is filling up. All right, the pool continues to fill up. Now we're gonna get a little drain in the pool next month, but I'm just wondering, you know, maybe some of what's going on right now is is already some front running to that drain. I could be completely wrong. This might be just, you know, monetarists ju just going crazy and losing their minds and, and selling on top of selling. That's why I can't wait to see the positions. Uh, I mean, today, today's market action took out the last three weeks. I, I was looking at the S&P E-mini contract, okay? In the last three weeks, large speculators, large funds, speculative funds that were already short, net short, that's shorts minus longs, net short 450,000. In the last three weeks, they added another 150,000 net shorts to bring it up to 600,000. So today, all of that selling, which was at the top of the run, they they all made they all had a chance to make their money back today. Even the the lowest sellers, even the ones who sold three weeks ago, which was near the bottom of that three week move up, they all had a chance to make their money back today. So that's impressive. Like I thought we'd see some. Remember yesterday I was talking about hey the pit is short. You know there are times, and I, I'll reflect back on my time as a floor trader. There were times, actually, it was rare, but there were times when the pit was short, and then some big monster trader came in and just really, really crushed it down, and we were like, "Yeah, you know, we let it go because we wanted we wanted that break." I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories about that. I mean, I really could. It was it was fascinating. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Uh, so, you know, the, the big, the big, uh, 800 pound gorilla today w was Powell maybe with his statement and that triggered a lot of selling. So, but I'm not worried because here's the thing, bottom line, the swimming pool is filling up. You know, timing is always like a conversation we can have. I mean, we can always have a conversation about timing, Mike, your timing is too early or blah, blah, blah. And I, I would not disagree. Everybody's different on that. 
Some people like to micro time, you know, just gotta be, everything gotta be absolutely right. I tend to be a little bit early, all right? I mean, that's just my nature. I see things and then I wanna do it. I, I'm, you know, I'm energized, I wanna do it. I, I see already three steps ahead in my mind how it's gonna play out, but we could, you know, we could have a discussion on timing and you might say, no, it's too early and this and that. I've, I've had people comment on here many times in the past when I said, you know, you got to buy this dip or whatever, and they're like, no, it's too early, it's too early. And then, you know, a few weeks later or a couple months later, we're way higher or whatever. So I'm not going to fault anyone on that if you say, oh, timing. It's just that that's not my thing. I, I You know, I, I'm into, like, I think action brings results. And my timing might be a little early, you know, it causes me to reflect. I mean, if you've ever read the book, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, and if you haven't, I would really recommend it. It's a great book. It was written by uh, Jesse Livermore, who was a great speculator in the late 19th and the mid, up to the mid 20th century. Uh, and it's a fun read. The book is a fun read. I used to give it out as a gift to my, the people who worked for me on the floor when I had my floor trader business. Um, he said he would do things, you know, to test the market. Like if he thought he was, and he was almost always a bear. <clears throat> he would sell some and see what happened. You know, if it went up, you know, that was the way he would gauge his timing. If he sold some short and then it went up, that was the way he could gauge his timing. Uh, so, you know, some people are like that. I, I, you know, when the market goes down and then I see a few steps ahead, you know, I don't try to micro time it. I'm not saying you can, you know, if that's your thing, you know, more power to you if you if you come up with a way to micro time it. But I, you know, I like to step back, see the macro picture. If things are lining up the way I think, you know, then I'm going to do what I think I should do. So anyway, that's it. Oh, listen, I think I forgot to mention, I got dismissed from jury duty today. It was my second day. Uh, today was jury selection. We were all in the courtroom. The judge called the first 20 people to, they had to go through a questionnaire and then they were, they were questioned, they had to respond to the questionnaire in public. They were seated in the jury box. They had to respond to the questionnaire to the judge and then the lawyers for the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the government, it was a criminal case. So, so the prosecuting attorney and the defense attorney, they got up and they were able to ask individual questions of the jurors. Now, I wasn't called in that first round. And that took a really long time. And I was like, oh, man, I'm going to be here all day. And then the judge says, we're going to take a little break for 20 minutes. And he sent everybody outside. All right, and we were waiting and waiting. And 20 minutes went by, a half an hour went by, 40 minutes went by, 45. I'm like, what the heck's going on? Then finally he called every, everybody back in and he said, <laughs> jurors of the state of New York, and I knew when he started off saying something like that, like he's going to make some big announcement. Thank you for your service. I was like, whoa, what do you mean? He said, you're all going to be dismissed because there was an unexpected resolution in the trial. So I didn't, even, I didn't even have to do the questionnaire. I didn't have to say anything. And everybody got dismissed. That's how it ended today. All right, everybody, it's Friday. Don't panic. Stay calm. The swimming pool is filling up. Let the monitorists do their thing, all right? They're going to be choking on this stuff in a couple of months. Believe me, maybe sooner. Take care. Bye.